Mr. Hastings, welcome back to Copenhagen and congratulations with your seemingly really fine success here in Denmark and the rest of the Nordic region. It seems that you now have entered some significant market in Europe, also the Netherlands this week. And uh, but how about the rest of uh, Europe? I'm thinking about you know Germany, the big countries: Germany, France, Italy, Spain. Is that something that's on your roadmap as well? Well, those are certainly great opportunities because the internet is so popular, you know, really around the world. Uh, but for now, we're focused on how do we just keep improving the content, getting more seasons, uh, more shows, more movies uh, here in Denmark and all throughout the Nordics. Yeah. Because we we have been uh, we've we done quite a lot of uh, surveys and we can see there's a phenomenon that some people are crossing the regional restrictions and actually accessing Netflix uh, in the U.S. from from Denmark and there seems to be a little impatience about uh, the content library. Uh, how, what's the situation right now? I, th- I think I guess that the only solution to that is that you get more and more global, uh, able to be making global releases of not just uh, your original content but shows in general. So how do you see the, the whole landscapes of rights uh, as it is right now? Well, we're the most impatient. Um, you know, we're so uh, looking forward to being able to get more and more content. And six years ago, we started streaming in the United States, and then we've grown the membership now over 30 million members in the United States. And that allows us to license and pay for more and more content. So now what we're doing throughout Europe is trying to grow as quickly as we can. And as we get more members, then we have more money we can spend on getting more content. And that's why the content's gotten so much better just over the last year from when we started in Denmark. Yeah, because here in Denmark we have had some uh, paradoxes, you know, uh, we have some really f- internationally famous Danish crime shows, as you know, Kill, Kill yeah. and Borg and so on. And someone has noticed that when the British Netflix users can can actually access those series, but we, we cannot ourselves, the Danes. Have you any good advice to the people working in, in, in the whole business of uh, dealing with rights in this country, of uh, what to do, how to solve the problems that they obviously have about uh, giving you the rights? You know, it's so frustrating for people because all of these rights are licensed exclusively. So when Viaplay licenses something, they block Netflix, or when HBO licenses something, they block Netflix, or the different TV networks. And so that's why it's chopped up between the different providers, which is frustrating for consumers. So in some markets, we're able to get some shows, like we have The Godfather here in the Nordics, and then we don't have it in the U.S., And so, you know, it's back and forth and it, it'll get better as the internet gets bigger, as we get bigger, because then we can license more and more of the content. Yeah, because if, if we, now that you said the internet, is, we could uh, talk a little about that, that actually what you're representing is the, uh, the ability to make complete global releases and global access to everything, but still you have a lot of the old-fashioned regional borders. Uh, Uh, and, and actually, I think in the future that internet distribution seems to be and will be bigger than actually the old-fashioned way of distributing television. How fast will this, will this go, you think? Uh, I think it's going to happen fast, and it's already happening in ways. So we've been so frustrated by the delays and the territory system that we decided to make some content ourselves. And so, for example, with House of Cards, with David Fincher directing and Kevin Spacey, that was our first big investment. And the advantage is then we control the rights and we release at the same time all around the world. So no delays, first run, really the first pure internet release of a great show. And we released all the episodes at once so people can decide when they want to watch and how often. And then we followed that up with Orange is the New Black, Hemlock Grove, Arrested Development, and just yesterday we released a new one, uh, Ricky Gervais doing Derek. And so it's kind of a specialty humor. I don't know if it's for everybody, but if you like his stuff, it's incredible. And again, we're releasing it in all the territories at the same time. So we're at the forefront of that. Everybody's equal. It's on the internet. It's the way it ought to be. It's consumer friendly. Well, you've been doing something like that with other with other shows, other producers. I noticed that you did something with Breaking Bad when the last seasons were released recently. Uh, I think only on the British market that people are able to follow the American uh, shows as they appear on American television on, on Netflix also. 
Is that a new way of doing it also? That's right. We're continuing to just push the boundaries of what's possible. And in that case, in the UK, we experimented. It's gone great with same-day release on new season of Breaking Bad. So we'll start to expand and do other things. Of course, Breaking Bad's almost finished now, so it won't be that. But the next show, we're trying to figure out how to get same day, no delays, great access of content for everyone here in Denmark. Yeah, and, and if, if you, as I do, talk a lot with people in the content production industry also, obviously a lot of people are actually very surprised about the arrival and the success of uh, Netflix, maybe even a little shocked about what's now happening. And why right are now. they surprised? <laughs> well, I didn't see, I think that a lot of people didn't even see the, the technology behind streaming where, where something that were capable of doing what you were doing on, on the market. And, uh, you know, all the, the other players around haven't really lived, gone to the, lift, the level that you are at sure. right now. But then the critical voices come and say, okay, what are we going to do now and we are missing money for production of our own local content will you uh, be looking at the Nordic countries as, as maybe even I mean people say that now that Netflix is a lot of money is t disappearing out of the country that maybe used to be in the country in the good old days of DVD distribution and so on are you looking at the Nordic region maybe especially Denmark could it be possible for you to put money in producing the killing part season four maybe or Absolutely. I mean, Denmark has, uh, you know, such a track record of uh, great television shows. And we started two years ago, uh, it was actually Norwegian, not Danish, but uh, with Lillehammer. And we funded part of the production with NRK for Lillehammer and helped it go to season two, which is in filming now. It'll be out in the winter. Um, and so that's a, a case where it's based, you know, here in the Nordics, not yet in Denmark. Um, and so we're all, that's an example of we're open to great storytelling and then trying to get not just a, a local audience, but how can we get to a global audience for those great stories? Yeah, because I think a lot of the people behind those uh, success, internationally successful series are looking at, okay, could we do something that could get a more um, instant global release instead of the, the old way of doing it together with a local broadcast and then sending it out in a system and even seeing that people are not able to get hold of those uh, seasons right now at all anywhere actually. Okay, could you talk a little about um, your, your, your general vision for the future of television and here I think especially on, on the topic of big data, the way that you are using all the, the information that you actually have, which I see as an analyst is something that we've never seen before in the history of television, a company knowing so much about the preferences and the behavior of their users. How are you going to use that or actually already using that for uh, so uh, buying you, rights and, and actually <coughs> buying both buying rights and producing original content? Sure. You know, if you think about the internet, <clears throat> it's transformed some sectors of the economy already. More are coming. It's changing our daily lives. And in television, in the next 10 or 20 years, almost all video watched is going to be internet video. And it's going to be on demand. So we've had almost 100 years of linear TV where someone decides 7 o'clock this show, 8 o'clock this show, 9 o'clock another show. And, you know, in 20 years, kids will say, what does it mean when they say a show's on at eight o'clock? You know, that's going to be a, a phrase that, that no one understands because it's becoming an on-demand world. And so all of the major stations uh, throughout the world are converting to becoming internet stations. A great example is the BBC with the BBC iPlayer that significantly expanded the audience for BBC content by doing their own internet and leading that way. So one part you'll see is each station today, each network is going to become an internet network and it becomes instead of channels, applications. So the future TV will look like a large iPad. It'll have a whole lot of applications from some for sports, some for TV, some for news, and you'll be able to choose and select your brands and they'll be easy to publish just like it's easy to make a new application today. A new content owner will have new ways of being able to publish and it'll be as easy as being an app and an app store, which then will show up on smart TVs and on iPads. And then in terms of the back end, the data side that you asked about, that's the part that's really just beginning. And what we're able to do, all the data goes into a secure uh, vault and no one is looking at it. But what the computer is doing is looking for patterns in the numbers. And then they see, oh, um, this person's watching a lot of kids content. 
let's make some suggestions for other kids content they may not have seen before. And that's how it gets more and more useful is giving those automated suggestions. And what's funny is it's all statistics. You know, the computer doesn't, it could be the weather data for all it knows. It's applying these algorithms, but it's moving around these numbers and then it comes out with these suggestions that are enormously useful and getting better all the time. So, so in that future and in that development as it progresses, uh, where do you see the good old fashioned broadcasters? So what are they going to do? Is it those people being part of that business or are they out of business? No, absolutely. If you think about the radio stations, you know, up to 1960, then they, most of them became television networks and they adapted to the new technology. And the current broadcasters are going to go now over the Internet. And so I think the uh, BBC is a great example um, where they're a traditional broadcaster. And that they, of course, they'll broadcast still for a very long time. But more and more of their viewing is over the Internet. And so that's what you'll see both on the public side and on the commercial side is more and more companies making a better and better internet presence for their content. So what do you think will happen? Uh, what, is, what will be the first thing that will happen with, with, with the experience of watching a broadcast, uh, a specific channel in the future? Because it doesn't seem to make sense for them to show uh, TV series and uh, movies. What, what will happen, you think? Will well, I think there'll be some natural segmentation where current networks will do more around sports and news and things that are real time, things that have a local connection. Um, but the internet is always uh, you know, partially a threat and partially an opportunity for all these companies. Um, and it really is, you have to go back to the evolution from radio to television. And if you looked at all the major radio stations were worried, what about this television thing? What's it going to do to us? And I'm sure some radio stations didn't adapt, but some became major television networks. And that's the opportunity as the internet comes to become an internet network and to have interactivity with your users. So Netflix is really a pathfinder with one particular type of content, movies and TV shows, very inexpensive, 79 krona a month, trying to figure out how do we do this at scale? And you know, we're learning. It's the same as any new field. And then everyone's looking at us and, and you know, using those lessons like Viaplay is doing a great job, HBO Nordics, you know, is catching up. And so there'll be a lot of choices and a lot of networks for people. Okay, could, could you, uh, the, the way that you planned the uh, major series that you have been uh, producing yourself, like House of Cards and Orange is the New Black, that's a lot of stories around on the internet, uh, how you mm, looked upon, looked at those big data and saw that. That's a lot of people interesting in, in, uh, in uh, intense political dramas with some cynical leads. Uh, is that something, how did you actually do that? How did you plan a series like that? And did you really give creative freedom to David Finch and Kevin Spacey? Yeah, we really did. Um, so there's one story that goes around that uh, we asked the computer what people want and then it generated the script. Okay, but that story is not true. Um, and but what we were able to do is take the script and look at it and say, what is this like? What are the things that are similar to it? And we actually, of course, it was similar to the original House of Cards, uh, the British one with Ian McDonald. And so then we were able to look and say, how did that do relative to other things? And then we could make a really good prediction. Because if that prediction was high, we could offer the most money to Kevin Spacey and to David Fincher. And so we were bidding actually against HBO, but we were more confident than they were about the show. And so we were able to put the highest bid in. And then they were really excited, of course, about the high bid. Uh, and then they knocked themselves out. They did such a good creative job. It's really amazing. And we certainly gave them the freedom to do that. Okay. Yeah. And congratulations because those shows are really uh, setting a new standard, I think, also personally. Well, wait till season two will oh. knock your socks off. Well, Next year, when? I mean, it's getting oh. filmed right now. It, okay. It's unbelievable. So we have to wait. 2014. Okay. It seems that you, uh, when you arrived in this concert, there was a lot of fuss about this, and certainly the, the whole concept of streaming was something everybody was talking about. And then, obviously, the local uh, uh, competitors to you did what they could to put something on the market. Uh, but it seems that you have actually uh, outperformed until actually, re uh, at least in this round one, you see UBU, Viaplay, and even HBO Nordic also. Uh, could you? 
try and sum up what is, uh, the, as you see, the recipe for your success compared to what's happening on this market, not just in our country, but also in your own home market? Well, from everything we can tell, Viaplay is doing very well, and many of our members also subscribe to Viaplay because it's different content. It's like two different channels. And so I think what we're seeing is lots of people are trying to figure out how to serve what consumers want. You know, video that plays anytime, that plays on a mobile phone and on a tablet and on a smart TV, and that's very inexpensive. You know, what we're really excited about is the low price, the 79 krona a month. And then, of course, the competitors match that price, um, which I'm sure they didn't like, but, you know, it's been great for consumers to, to have that competition. And the formula around the world is pretty similar, which is as we grow, more and better content, more and better content. And then that helps us grow. Then we do more and better content. And, you know, we're really at the beginning of that. Um, if you look in the U.S., almost one in three households are now subscribing to Netflix and it's just continuing to grow because we're making the content better and better. And that's the same thing that we're having now all through the Nordics, which is as we grow, we're able to license more. Um, concerning licensing, is, isn't the, the tendency to people owning the license that they now raise the price right, to, for people like you buying the, the, uh, the rights for their uh, products? Yeah, the artists always want more money. And, you know, if you've got friends who are artists, you can't blame them. Um, you know, Netflix is succeeding for sure. And, of course, you know, every artist thinks, oh, it's because of my show that Netflix is succeeding. And that's natural and probably quite healthy. So... The concept of Netflix as it is right now, will you stick to that or would you are you considering moving into, say, transactional uh, services like uh, video on demand, new releases? Uh, because as it is now, when, when you own a box like maybe the Apple TV box, it's like Netflix is what Netflix is. And then if you want the new movies, you go somewhere else, the iTunes or Voodoo or some places like that. Are you considering that at all? Uh, There's so many types of video. There's pay-per-view, there's um, ad-supported like YouTube, um, there's, uh, you know, just video every sport. And we only do movies and TVs by subscription with no commercials. So we're just 79 krona a month, no commercials, very simple. And we're not trying to be all things. We're not also going to be YouTube and, you know, also going to be sports online and uh, also going to be these other things. So we're doing great stand-up comedy, great documentaries, um, so movies, uh, TV shows. Uh, but that's the fundamental focus. We do have a lot of great kids content. You could say we've expanded, you know, over the last couple of years into uh, amazing kids content. But again, TV shows and movies. Okay, so you'll stick to that. Because also, I, I've been uh, following a concept like ultraviolet, when, when they market, uh, when Hollywood are marketing through ultraviolet, they are uh, playing a lot on, on the idea about that you have to build your own library, you still have to own your favorite movies. Do you think that, uh, as, as you see the behavior of your users, that people are, th is that the mindset of uh, a lot of people, or just few people, or maybe in the future no people, wanting to build a library or just having access to a cloud-based streaming service? Well, think about how we feel about books, and we have a library of books. It's not because we're going to reread the book, you know, five times. It's somehow, it's like an expression of self. That's a book I read. It's something we can talk about. And so I think what the movie companies are trying to do is recreate that connection, and it's harder with a digital good. So I'm not sure how big that market will be. I know that I sometimes buy movies, uh, you know, on, on iTunes and Ultraviolet because I want to get access to the movie. Um, so it's certainly part of the market. It seems that you also now, uh, when you enter this country, you are educating Danish users in what to expect for a streaming service and uh, your competitors or other suppliers of streaming services are really fighting hard right now. Uh, and uh, again, we must congratulate you for having setting, set the bar, isn't that an American president? Set mm -hmm. the bar really, really high on this market. Have you any um, good advices for people in this business uh, for what to do to make a smooth streaming service? What, what's, what's the, as you see, the, the main criteria for the success that you have had in the technology behind and the service that you deliver? 
Well, I think the main thing in, in any business is not get distracted by the competitors and really focus on the customers and how do we make it a better customer experience. Um, in terms of the actual streaming mechanics, um, it's fairly simple nowadays um, to do these streaming servers and we've even open sourced or given out to the public um, plans for a streaming server on our Open Connect. So if any competitor wants, they can visit openconnect.netflix.com. And what we're trying to do, it's the design for a box to serve these bits, is to make it very easy for anybody to distribute high quality, low cost streaming so that we can just raise all the bar, well, raise the bar again, um, for all streaming. Because when the competitors do a great job and we do a great job on streaming, it'll help move people from linear TV over to internet TV. And also, uh, actually this week, I think surprisingly, you made a, a deal with uh, Virgin Media, I think it was in the UK, about mm -hmm. uh, the box, because it seem, they seem to be one of those uh, hit quite hard by the competition from the internet and streaming services. But now you have made a deal with Netflix being available on uh, the Virgin Media box, and it seems to be the first time that you do that kind of uh, agreement. Uh, is, are we going to see something like that in the Nordic region, or do you think you appearing on uh, existing boxes on the market, existing television boxes? Well, in the UK market, Virgin is a leading company, and they do both a video service and a internet service, broadband service, and fiber everywhere. They're super high speed, and they're very well regarded. So they've always been a, a technology uh, maverick leader. Now, for Virgin customers, they use Netflix in a smart TV, say from Samsung or Sony. Uh, they'll also use Netflix you know, from a game console like a PS3 or Xbox. And so I think what Virgin said is, well, why not also have it be on our set-top box? Um, so at least people are they're clearly using Netflix. If we get them to use it on the set-top box, it might be a little better experience because they can also do linear at the same time. So they've taken a very leading-edge view of that. And in general, we find the European companies are more oriented towards that than what we've seen in the U.S. And so I would hope that we would see more of that, um, you know, throughout the Nordics and, and Denmark in particular uh, over the coming months. But what I've noticed from uh, what I've read is that you also allow Virgin to have an interface where you are able to make a search like Kevin Spacey and uh, there will be maybe the usual suspect from the Virgin service and then also the search engine will give the result that Netflix is also having a series That's called right. Half-Second. So you're actually doing a combination of uh, your own data with the data that the Virgin have themselves? Yeah, it's so convenient that way, right? Because the consumers, they don't want to deal with like all the different services. They want to have something they can search and find, you know, where's the thing that they want. And so we're continuing to learn and discover and how to make that just easy so that it's satisfying for people. And then they'll, you know, people will want to subscribe to Netflix, well, in that case, and a virgin. So let's talk a little about technology and the future of television technology, uh, stuff like 3D and 4K. Uh, are you looking into 4K and do you personally believe that people actually want to replace flat screens again for given even a higher resolution experience in the homes? Well, 3D obviously in the homes, not a big seller. That didn't really work out and, and you were seeing less and less programming on 3D. Um, with 4K, I don't know that many people are going to run out and buy a 10,000 euro television um, because, uh, you know, it's 4K. But what will happen is you'll have a 4K laptop, a 4K tablet, okay, because the screen resolutions are improving so quickly in the next few years. And eventually, there'll be no premium, no extra cost for a 4K television. And then just when you need a new television, you'll get, you know, a good television and it just will be 4K because the costs eventually won't be any different than the current televisions today. And so that's how 4K comes about. And once you've seen the picture, if you've got 4K source material, um, it's, it's really pretty extraordinary. How much source material is out there? I mean, the library that you have, I, I guess that your news shows like House of Cards again must probably be produced in, in 4K resolution. Uh, are there a lot of material out there as a license buyer in 4K if you want to offer that to your customers? There's gaps. So in the historical uh, business on film, you can convert film, has a density that's around 4K. So you can convert film, to, assuming it's high quality stock, into 4K. 
Then there's the time when everything's been on video but hasn't been 4K and filmed on video. And now, of course, um, all new things are being captured in 4K. Uh, so it'll be an interesting gap uh, through time. But going forward, we'll see more and more 4K, and that'll work really well over the Internet. Have you said any time, do you, are you going to offer 4K in the foreseeable future? Uh, next year, we said, we're not sure exactly when, but um, by next year, there'll be enough um, sets out and it will take, you'll have to have a 4K TV, so it's a special audience, or a 4K tablet, which, you know, we may see some next year of those. So have you made the calculations already for the, the demand for, of uh, bandwidth to actually be able to deliver 4K? Uh, we have, it's, it's around 15 megabits a second. So it's not too bad, you know, if you've got a 50 megabit connection, you'll be fine. And only a few people in the neighborhood, in any given neighborhood, will be watching 4K at a time. So as an overall system load, it'll, it'll grow quite slowly and steadily, giving people lots of time to build the infrastructure. Could you talk a little about your relation to the, the telcos out there? I mean, it, it seems to be a fact that you uh, uh, that Netflix is a service running up to a third, I think, of all internet traffic in the North American region in the peak, on Friday peak night on peak hours. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, what do the telcos uh, tell you when you meet them? Well, there's two sides to each company. There's the operation side, which says, "Oh, there's so much traffic." And then there's the revenue side, which say the customers love our broadband for using Netflix. So we get, we get both sides of it. So on the operation side, we try to help them with our Open Connect server, lower the cost for them, uh, bring the bits close to them, and, and integrate the networks. And on the revenue side, they're doing great work because a reason to upgrade to a 50 megabit or 100 megabit package partially is to do internet video. And so, again, on the revenue side, anyone who has fiber, uh, who has the new architectures, is really excited about internet video, like Netflix, and also video conferencing, like Skype and Google Hangouts, because those also use a lot of bandwidth. So, so you, you conclude at this point in time that, that the telcos are your friends and they're happy uh, for a service like you being around, actually wanting people more bandwidth. That's more right. Band, yeah. Okay. That's right. Think about it uh, over the last 25 years with Intel microprocessors and then Mac and Windows. Um, you know, and the processors are faster and then the apps are richer and use the power. And you get that kind of loop together. And it's the same with more bandwidth and then more video applications. Both the two-way kind, like uh, Google Hangouts and Skype and, and those, and also uh, the one-way like uh, Netflix and, and competitors. So, so the, the main mindset is not that we have customers and we have a lot of uh, cost in actually being able to deliver your service. They say, okay, you are delivering a service uh, that want our customers to get more data. Is that which of those mindset is more predominant? Is it? it depends on who you talk to. If you talk to the revenue side, you know, that, that talks to the customers, then they love us. If you talk to the operation side, then they say, you know, the costs are, there's a lot of bits. And then we help on the operation side, you know, with the Open Connect servers to reduce the costs. So the, the Open Connect concept is something that uh, the ISPs and the uh, telcos are actually taking. They are. Um, almost all of the ISPs, they integrate with it, and then uh, it makes it uh, easier for them. Okay. Um, yeah, seem to be covering most of the stuff. Maybe a little more about your user interface. Your user, you, you just recently introduced uh, some new services on your user interface, like profiling and so on. So, what, what do you see in the, in the future? That what are you working on right now? What kind of new features will we be seeing on the interface from Netflix? Well, think how much tablets have changed. You know, over the last five years, they've just gotten better and easier and faster. And we're constantly learning new ways of you know, using touch in the interface to make it fun and enjoyable. The same thing on the TV, as new TVs come about, it makes it very easy to use uh, with the new controls. And so we're using the underlying hardware to try to make the interface more fun and richer, more engaging. Okay. So, um when you look at the market right now, not just in the Nordic region, but also your home market, uh, competitors are around, like Amazon Video, and I think there's a lot of services now. 
appearing probably in the future. Um, what do you see as the biggest threat for Netflix in the coming years, competitive-wise? You know, people always talk about the threats, and I think that the fundamental threat is taking things for granted and not trying your best. Because we've been very successful, we've been in business for 15 years now, growing. Um, but our focus is really on how do we make the content better and better and better. And to be honest, most customers, they don't want a hundred services. You know, they want a half dozen. And eventually, what we want to be is one of those. And so to do that, we have to really make our service great to be able to grow, to get more content. Um, and then we can make people just so happy with so much content. And, and that's what we're excited about. When you launched in Denmark last year, in October, HBO Nordic also launched at, at the same time. And they seem to have been struggling quite a lot uh, on this market. Have you any advice to the HBO Nordic uh, operations? Uh, shouldn't they just have uh, the HBO no uh, content on, on your service or what to do? Well, sometimes they, they may do that eventually. We'll see. Um, they have such great content. Like, although we compete with HBO, you know, I'm an HBO subscriber at home. Um, and I love their shows. And so, you know, it's, uh, I think they'll probably do fine if they eventually want to license content in, in certain countries to us. That's also great. It's kind of up to them. And I think they need to experiment a little. What about Netflix as a company itself compared to HBO? Are you seeing that model HBO with a lot of original content, you move in the same direction? I mean, do you really How much will you invest in original content in the future compared to buying license? Is that uh, your, one of your main areas of investment or will uh, it be a combination still? Well, already our global content budget is as big or bigger than HBO's. And so we're really making some great progress. We're at 37 million members around the world, 41 countries. So I think eventually we'll be able to do lots of licensed content from you know current artists, also lots of production and helping new stories get told. And if we do that, then we should be able to attract more members and continue to grow. And we'll build on top of the success of HBO. So that is probably one of your main strategies, more original content. And That's correct. Globally released original Content. That's right. And, and content from around the world, like I mentioned, uh, Lilla Hammer, and we'll have some uh, Derek, you know, out of the UK. So we really want to curate some of the world's best content, you know, the best Chilean movies, the best, um, you know, Norwegian comedies, uh, the best Danish thrillers, um, you know, and, and get them out to the whole world and connect the world. But we're only at 41 countries, so we got, a, we got another 160 to go. Thanks a lot, Mr. Hastings, for your time, and uh, hope to see you back in Copenhagen soon again. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you.